using it, frankly. This program has been around for quite some time. Uh, but last summer, uh, the, uh, the, the federal government, uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, a couple of appropriations that uh, our port groups were, were behind and supported, um, started to uh, subsidize a bigger percentage of, this, uh, of, of these uh, insurance risk programs that are available to us. And so, um, so for those of us that are also involved in row crop operations and have some, have some feel for that, we now have uh, the, on the livestock side of things, on the hog side of things in particular, a, a, crop, a, a, a risk protection insurance program that acts a little bit similar to what crop insurance would, at least uh, from the perspective of subsidies, which again, uh, most of us have an understanding of. In the interest of uh, introductions here, I would like to just take a second and, and, uh, and just provide a little bit of background if I could. Uh, again, my name is Pat Von Tersch. Uh, I'm the principal uh, owner of Professional Ag Marketing. There's, there's eight of us uh, in the upper Midwest that uh, that work with, uh, that have the opportunity to work with livestock producers and grain producers on risk management. And uh, our emphasis, no doubt, is, is in the, the hog space here. And uh, I, uh, I grew up in Denison, Iowa, grew up in West Central Iowa, went to school at Iowa State University, uh, spent a decade or so with Cargill in grain merchandising and grain elevator management. Cargill, in fact, is what moved me uh, up to Southwest Minnesota, uh, uh, Laverne, Minnesota, uh, Met my wife up here and, and, and uh, have been here since uh, uh, the mid 90s. So I've so been up in this area of the world for a while and, and, uh, and uh, started to do risk management in 2001. And, uh, and uh, the firm uh, uh, Professional Ag Marketing uh, uh, is uh, headquartered here today. So let me just hop into some details if I could on, on how this, uh, uh, the LRP uh, uh, type uh, works here. And then we'll also talk about LGM briefly. And then uh, we'll turn it over uh, to the to the moderators here and and, uh, and look for questions afterwards. But so first of all, let me just again just dive in uh, livestock risk protection. Uh, the producer picks the number of head uh, that uh, they would like to insure, and you have an option or choices on length of coverage. And so uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different choices now. Which is, a, uh, which is a very recent change in the last two weeks. They just recently increased the endorsement length to 52 weeks. It stopped at 26 weeks uh, uh, through mid-Jan. So, so every afternoon, the LRP shows a, uh, a quote for each one of these uh, uh, time segments uh, uh, reaching out to a, a year from now. Producer chooses the level of coverage that they'd like to, uh, to utilize and then also a target weight that's within this range of a 203 to 304 pounds live. Uh, again, a recent update here, you can now do 40,000 head per policy, that was 20. Uh, and you can also, it's now expanded to 150,000 per year uh, instead of 75,000 per year. And as the USDA defines that, uh, it's a crop year that ends on, on June 30th. And so, so that's uh, the maximums now per policy per year uh, that we can use. And then they also modified the, the, the uh, livestock ownership requirement to 60 days instead of 30. So uh, if you do, you know, whatever the, the max number of head that you can insure at any one time is, uh, is uh, the can't exceed your production or marketings for a 60 day window now prior to when the, uh, the level of coverage expires. So I just dove into a bunch of details there and the way to think about LRP is that it's an awful lot like an exchange traded put option. And so this, uh, this screen uh, that I have pulled up here now is, uh, gives you a little bit of an example. And these, these, are, these quotes are actually uh, effective last, uh, well, the 22nd, so six days old, but it'll give you a flavor for um, what we're talking about here. The 13-week uh, premium uh, uh, that expires on April 23rd in this example, uh, it had a LRP strike price of 78.80 that day, and the, the premium was $3.78 a hundred. And so that same put option or, or a, a similar put option on the board of course, a little different expiration date than April 23rd and a little bit different strike, 
but the price uh, on the board is 533. So uh, at least in this example, give you a buck 55 cheaper put option uh, than than uh, than what was offered on the board that day. And so uh, this is a this this quote sheet that we've created uh, that we interact with uh, uh, on our client with our clients allows for us to draw those comparisons. And we think it's important to uh, watch the, the spread or the relationship between um, what, uh, what put options are trading at on the board uh, compared to what uh, you can buy similar coverage for uh, through the LRP product. And so, um, so I think it's important as we kind of learn more about this process as we go forward. And in fact, you know, we're just starting to get now some of the first uh, expiration sort of run to the, uh, uh, you know, run to the end of the program here in the middle of January. So, so uh, you know, the process is relatively new in terms of, of how it works. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're finding that it's, uh, that it works pretty effectively in, in allowing for us to not only uh, sync up uh, opportunities to manage price risk or manage lower prices in, in lower markets, um, and sync it up with exchange traded options, uh, we can also uh, learn to uh, manage uh, some price risk uh, outside of uh, traditional option month expiration. So an example of, you know, the 60 day window from December expiration on hogs to February expiration, this allows for some coverage or convergence against the index uh, for the middle of January as, as well. So. Um, so a little bit of a, of a summary here on, on, uh, uh, on LRP and, and some of the advantages from a producer's perspective. Um, you know, it uh, allows us to capture that level of subsidy on the put options ranging from 35 to 55%. Again, can mention, you know, mention we can protect hogs marketed in the middle of, of, uh, of exchange traded contracts, can now buy out to 52 weeks out. Um, and it's possible, you know, one thing to sort of think, another thing to sort of think about here is that uh, um, we can get comfortable, you know, being hedged at higher levels uh, uh, with, a, with a, a, a livestock insurance tool than what we maybe otherwise would on, on some of the more aggressive uh, hedging strategies that we've utilized in the past. So, you know, maybe that means instead of taking your level of coverage on a group of pigs or a a quarter of pigs or, or something like that, instead of taking that coverage and you know, up to 65 or 70% and stopping, uh, maybe it makes some sense to, to uh, uh, run that coverage up to 80, 85, 90%, uh, you know, with some long LRP coverage. And so, um, so something that, you know, there's all kinds of different applications to this tool, especially when you start to think about how it can interact with other trading strategies that you might utilize. Um, it's, uh, uh, another advantage of this uh, of this of this uh, product is that premiums aren't due until expiration, uh, and, and so you don't have to uh, come up with the cash on the on the, the, the long insurance thing until until it reaches that expiration time. Kind of interesting how it works from an order entry perspective. Uh, we get the quotes uh, you know, four four thirty in the afternoon Central Time, and they have to be placed by nine a.m. the next morning, and so. Uh, there's really that that window from uh, 4:30 at night, uh, prior night to uh, uh, nine o'clock next morning, when you really have a have the opportunity to make a decision on on that particular quote, and we'll get refreshed again uh, that uh, that late afternoon. One thing to keep in mind from a uh, from a disadvantage perspective is that once that uh, uh, once that product is purchased, you know it's you're done. It's not any different than a regular insurance policy with a with a time date on it, uh, um, it's uh, it, it, there is an, an opportunity for management within you know the LRP system. Once you've written the policy, uh, I guess there would be some opportunity to to offset by exchange if you're interested in doing so. But uh, the policy itself is is really on autopilot once it's written. All right, so this is, uh, I, I won't spend a ton of time on this summary sheet here, but just wanted to, to provide a, a little bit of a flavor of the, uh, the importance, I think, as you sort of integrate this, this particular tool into your marketing plan, uh, the importance of making sure uh, that, we're, uh, that we figured out a good way to sort of track that with the other, the other uh, risk profiles that you might have going on for your operation. 
Uh, the other tool uh, that's being offered is LGM Livestock Gross Margin. And just uh, the, just as a, a reminder, the, the, there's, you can only do one or the other. If you're an LGM person, uh, you can't be an LRP person, at least not for this crop year. So, so you got to pick uh, one or the other. Livestock gross margin, think about that as a way to uh, protect the historical crush. So LGM, livestock gross margin, uh, uh, essentially is buying corn calls, soybean calls, uh, soybean meal calls, and then also buying hog puts. So it's defending the crush, whereas LRP, livestock risk protection, is just defending revenue, just defending you from lower hog prices. So that's the, the fundamental difference between the two. This too has been around for a while, but has recently uh, become more attractive uh, because of the subsidy levels that it enjoys. Uh, LGM uh, offered once a month versus LRP offered more or less every day. LGM uh, is offered on the first Friday of every month. So uh, coincidentally, uh, uh, the last Friday of every month, excuse me. So coincidentally, uh, this Friday is when we get uh, uh, refreshed quotes from livestock gross margin. And instead of, in, in, the, in danger of diving into too much detail on this product, I think what I'd like to do is just show a little bit of a teaser here if I could. And this is the quotes um, from the, the last LGM quote that came out at the end of, of last month. And it's showing that it would defend an $80.80 per head gross margin for a premium cost of $6.86. So, so when I think about defending 80 bucks, and again, this is uh, 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 protecting corn and meal prices from, from moving higher, protecting hog values from moving lower at a rate and defending $80.80. And for perspective, uh, many of you uh, uh, have seen you know, our generic hog margin worksheet that, uh, uh, you know, that we send out of, out of our uh, office every day. But we have a tendency to sort of uh, think about the, uh, the opportunity on crush uh, very similar to how LGM is showing that, meaning that what's your cost to raise a pig, everything outside of cornmeal and DDGs, um, you know, versus today's revenue. Uh, this sheet happened to be print last night, just to make the point is showing a $4.50 per head margin. If we look out over, over a 12 month crush, you know, um, but what we're using there is we're assuming a $91 per head all in expense outside of cornmeal and DDGs. And so that $91 all expense uh, minus corn DDG and meal, that's a similar number to the 80 bucks that this thing is defending just in terms of I was thinking about what livestock gross margin defends for you. So it gives you the opportunity to engage in a product that, uh, that uh, allows for you to protect gross margin uh, instead of just revenue. And so from our perspective, at least, uh, we've been a, a bit more aggressive uh, uh, as it relates to managing the risk uh, associated uh, uh, on the revenue side of things. And, uh, uh, versus using LGM, we've been a little bit more uh, inclined to, to use LRP, but uh, uh, we think that there's a, a nice application for both products uh, uh, for a bunch of different businesses here. So, uh, you know, Lee, that's, uh, that's the kind of the, the quick version nuts and bolts of, of what I wanted to uh, at least expose everyone to today. Um, and and, and uh, looking forward to the opportunity to, to answer any questions after the other two presentations. Thank you very much, Pat, and thanks for taking that audible so well. Um, I, we have a bunch of seasoned vets here on, on the panel. Um, and, and I'll remind our, our viewers that we're, we're happy to take questions. We'll answer those questions at the end. Uh, so you can share those in the, the, the question box um, and let us know, and we'll, we'll direct those uh, to the, the, the various speakers at the end. If you have a specific question for a specific speaker, um, it is helpful if you know which speaker that, that is for. Our, our next presenter is Bill Kalin. He's a managing member of K&M Trading. Uh, Bill will focus on research and trading in ag markets 
like the CME cutout and other price discovery topics. Uh, so we look forward to your talk, Bill, um, and take it away. I want to start today by thanking the Iowa Pork Congress and all those that worked so hard to put this webinar together. While we all wish this could have been done in person, not having the conference at all would have prevented the exchange of ideas that we're going to have today. So once again, thank you to everyone who's worked so hard to make this happen. I was asked to speak today on price discovery and how and why the new CME pork cutout contract will play a role in enhancing it. While the issue of price discovery does not often rise to the top of most observers' list of critical issues, I contend that the lack of price discovery in today's hog and pork industry is causing issues that have left unchecked will alter the way the industry looks and operates well into the future. So as an outline for today's discussion, I'll break my thoughts into four main sections. Price discovery, first of all, what is it? Secondly, do we have it in today's swine industry? Thirdly, do we even need it? And if so, can we get it? So price discovery, what is it? I define price discovery as the process by which a fair market price is determined through interactions between buyers and sellers, ultimately matching supply and demand. The price that results oftentimes is an important reference price for that market or industry. Price discovery, do we have it in today's swine industry? I think the answer is definitely not in today's negotiated hog market. As this chart shows, our industry has seen a rapidly growing number of hogs being slaughtered in recent years, which most would conclude is a sign of a market where price discovery could easily take place. However, there are two trends that have had a material impact on the inability of the negotiated hog market to thrive and importantly provide a platform for price discovery. First, as this chart suggests, we have a growing number of hogs being slaughtered in the hands of the packers themselves. In recent years, we've had several packing plants built or actually change hands, and almost all of them have been built or bought by producer groups. Now, this chart indicates that at this time, 40% of the barrels and gilts that are slaughtered are in the hands of the packers themselves, and by definition, these hogs don't transact in a fair negotiated open market. Second, as this chart shows, within the shrinking percentage of producer-owned hogs that we still do slaughter today, we now have a very small percentage of those hogs being transacted in the open market. These two trends combined have resulted in an uninterrupted downtrend in the percentage of hogs slaughtered that are negotiated. And we now regularly see the negotiated producer trade represent less than 1% of the total barrels and gilts slaughtered in any given day. Low volume is clearly not a good thing. However, if that volume is still being done by a reasonably large number of buyers and sellers, I'd contend it's at least tolerable. The situation in my mind went uh, from bad to worse in the negotiated market in the middle of 2019. In late June and through big chunks of July of 2019, not only was the volume in the negotiated hog market low, but the number of transactions or traders were so low that the USDA was unable to report the Western Corn Belt prices. The Eastern Belt's been struggling with this issue for many years now. Specifically, the USDA stated that the thinness of the negotiated market has made it increasingly difficult for AMS to publish regional market information while maintaining the confidentiality requirements. So the thin borderline non-existent cash market is a serious problem for cheating price discovery in my mind. An additional and probably related problem for the industry is that we uh, increasingly are seeing a divergence in the prices received by hog farmers. As this chart shows, historically, there was a strong correlation between the prices received by farmers. However, taking a closer look at recent prices received, there are increasingly large gaps opening up between prices received depending on the marketing arrangement a particular farmer might have. So I believe it's clear that the negotiated hog market today is too small to allow for effective price discovery. And as a result, we, you know, we don't have a common measure of value for, for hog farmers today. The question then arises is, do we even need price discovery? I believe the answer is clearly yes, especially if we want an industry that is going to continue to be characterized by a large number of independent producers. The hog market is still populated today by a large number of independent producers. On the other hand, we have a chicken industry in the United States that is mostly contract growers. Question is, why is this? Uh, while there are many reasons these two meat industries have so far gone in different directions, I will contend that there are two primary requirements for an industry to be characterized by independent producers as opposed to contract growers. 
Uh, first, uh, you need a clear and transparent transaction price for livestock if you're going to have an independent producer selling to an independent packer. And secondly, and maybe more importantly, you need access to independent capital and effective risk management tools. Like I said, there are many variables at work, but I would suggest that the lack of price discovery and the lack of clear, consistent, and common prices for hogs have been strong drivers of the historic trend towards a larger and larger percentage of the hogs being in the hands of the packers themselves. So I believe that industry needs to have a price that can establish value and economic signals can be sent in a clear, consistent, and transparent manner. I hope I've established why I believe the negotiated hog market can't perform this function. Uh, the question becomes, is price discovery even possible in today's industry? I believe the answer is yes, and I believe the best candidate to fill this role in today's industry is the negotiated pork cutout. So while wholesale pork cutout prices have been around for many years, importantly starting in 2013, the USDA has been reporting on a daily basis the value of the wholesale pork cutout under a mandatory price reporting mandate. This mandatory pricing is a vital component to the cutout becoming a transparent and trusted measure of value. The volume traded in the pork cutout has been relatively stable and compared to the negotiated hog market is relatively large at six to seven times the size. Uh, also, I'll note that the negotiated pork represents about 25% of all wholesale pork that trades. Uh, this compares to 1% or less in the negotiated hog market. I mentioned earlier risk management and access to independent capital as key parts of allowing producers to remain independent. And in early December of last year, the CME listed a contract tied to the USDA daily negotiated pork cutout. Specifically, the contract is tied to the USDA mandatory cutout report LMPK 602. It settles to an index, which is a five day average of this cutout. And importantly, is the same size, uh, has the same tick value, settlement months as a lean hog contract. Uh, I have limited time in this presentation, but more information on the cutout contract and how it can be used can be found on the CME website. And I encourage everyone to learn about this new tool and make all efforts to use it. I personally think it's an important uh, part of the future of this. To me, the listing of the contract itself strengthens the case for adopting the cutout as the market for price discovery in today's swine industry. And itself is a reflection of how important the cutout price metric already is. The current CME Lean Hug Index increasingly struggles to be a useful tool for today's industry for two primary reasons. Number one, still largely tied to a market, the negotiated hog market, that as I pointed out earlier, is no longer liquid enough to provide accurate prices. And secondly, the Lean Hog Index lacks transparency as a growing, but importantly, uncertain amount of the index is tied to the pork cutout itself. Uh, the bottom line is that these issues combined with the fact that the industry has no common transaction price have combined to significantly reduce the lean hog contracts usefulness as a risk management tool. So in summary, uh, the negotiated hog market can no longer be relied on to provide price discovery in today's hog and pork industry. This issue has been a growing issue for the swine industry for a long time. And while there have been endless calls and futile attempts to reverse the trend, recent developments indicates to me that in all likelihood we've reached the point of no return. Second, price discovery or benchmark price is necessary if the industry is going to remain populated by independent producers. We need price discovery and we need a common measure of value. No common measure of value leaves the industry going in too many directions and never allows it to speak with one voice around issues related to livestock marketing. The negotiated pork cutout is a logical market where price discovery occurs in today's hog and pork industry. By my math, in excess of 60% of the barrels and gills that die in today's industry are already using the cutout to determine their value. And this number is only likely to grow in the future. Finally, the negotiated pork cutout and the CME index, uh, CME contract based on it, should swiftly be adopted as the dominant benchmark and risk management tool in today's hog and pork industry. I understand that the negotiated cutout is not perfect, and there will be those that point to things like it doesn't reflect values of products sold forward, product that sold exports, or a formula, or off all values. That said, it is vastly superior in terms of liquidity relative to the neg negotiated hog market, and frankly speaking, is all we have. Uh, I also understand that while it will take time for the volume and open interest in the cutout contract to reach levels that are sufficient for it to be a tool for the whole industry. With all that said, the cutout and a futures contract tied to it provide meaningfully more transparent, 
consistent and valuable information of what the true value of the livestock the industry produces today is. And I encourage everyone in the industry, whether it be packers, producers, active specs, uh, or passive commodity indexes to do their part to use the new contract. Uh, I frankly believe that success or lack thereof will play a pivotal role in shaping how the industry looks well into the future. So with that said, I'll stop, uh, but want to thank again everyone who's made this webinar possible, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you, Bill, for a great presentation. Our final panelist is Tim Hughes. Tim is a member of CIH management team who also leads hog margin management leads the hog margin management team. He'll talk about pig, how pig farmers can identify margin opportunities and manage risk. Welcome, Tim. Good afternoon. This is Tim Hughes with CIH. I uh, just want to start by thanking Iowa Pork for the invitation to speak and to be part of this great panel. Um, we only have 10 minutes today, and this is a pretty big topic to cover uh, in 10 minutes. So obviously just going to hit the high point, and I do have um, kind of a lot of slides, you know, relative to the time that, that we have to get through. So um, we'll go through them pretty quick. Uh, we did do a, a webinar on this exact topic uh, back in August through Iowa Pork and through the Iowa Pork Industry Center at Iowa State. So I will provide the link to that on the last slide here. And it's about a 45 minute webinar that would take this topic and, and dive into it in a lot more detail. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, but know that that is available for those that want to, uh, to take a look at it. So today we're gonna look at basically three different uh, uh, analysis tools that we've developed at CIH in order to help our clients better understand how their contract stacks up to the industry. Um, the centerpiece of this will be the USDA swine contract library, um, but first we're going to take a look at why it is so important these days to, to know this information and through our cash contract analysis tool uh, that gives you kind of the, the revenue side or the historical side of how your contract has performed. Then we'll take a look at the USDA swine contract library and the tool we told to help query that information, as well as the hog net price distribution. The difference between those two is that the USDA swine contract library is kind of theoretical in nature. It gives you the, the contracts that pigs are being delivered upon. What the hog net price distribution does is it takes that and puts it into a real application because the hog net price distribution will give you the, the exact price within $2 buckets of how much each pig that was processed on a specific day or over history has been paid. So those would be the three quick high points that we'll, that we'll hit on today. So first off is why is this so important? And, and why, is it, why has it become even more important? And the reason for that is the bottom line is that cut out and negotiated cash hogs have continued to diverge pretty much every year since 2014. Last year being the biggest divergence, as you can see in this chart. What this is showing you is that prior to last year, if you look at, say, May, the highest difference between national cash and cutout would have been about $12 per hundredweight. It may have last year that rallied to about almost $80 per hundredweight difference. It created this massive gap between what producers are being paid based off of their contract, whether it was based off cash or cut out or a combination of the two. To illustrate that, we're gonna take a look at two different operations. We're gonna assume that each produces 30,000 head per year. Operation one will deliver all their pigs against national negotiated cash plus 350. We'll say that that's our hog supply agreement. Operation two will be delivering pigs into a contract 90% of cutout, okay? If you look at the red box here, what you're looking at is the difference in revenue between those two operations over the last one year, three year, and five years. It's staggering. 
just in the last one year alone, someone getting paid 90% of cutout has been paid roughly $1.15 million more on a 30,000 head operation than someone delivering into national cash plus three billion. On the three years, it's 1.8 million. And on the five year, it's north of 2.5 million and it's over $500,000 per year. Just a massive gap between the two. Could have the same input costs, could have the same uh, quality pigs, could be neighbors. And that would be the difference in the revenue stream. So that, that's why this is so important and has become more and more important through the years. So how do we start evaluating uh, contracts versus others? There is a, an awesome tool um, that the USDA keeps. It's called the USDA Swine Contract Library. It, it's run under the, the jurisdiction of the Packers and Stockyards Act. And what it is, it's a mandatory reporting by the Packers of each individual contract that they offer to their producers. And it's important to keep in mind the intent of this. You know, this started all the way back in, I believe it was 2000. And the Swine Contract Library, as you can see here, is intended to aid the price discovery process and provide equal access to market information for all market participants. It, it was built for you as a producer to know, and for packers, to know what contracts are out there and being delivered upon at any current time. Problem is that not a whole lot of producers know about it. And very few that, that I work with knew about it um, even just a year ago or two years ago. So what we did is we took that, that library, downloaded all of the, uh, the contracts in it. You're looking at north of a thousand contracts. So it did take quite some time to, to build this. But what we did is build a tool in order to query it. Okay. So what you're looking at here is a bar chart. On the left hand or, or the access would be the amount of contracts that are that were delivered upon or that are out there, not necessarily delivered upon in this day, but are out there in the swine contract library that would, would equate to each price point on this chart. So for instance, ISM plus 270, that contract on Monday would have paid $57 per hundred weight. And you can see that there's a pretty big area or, uh, or, or quantity of contracts in this one area. And then there's a little bit of a low, right? And then you've got this other uh, little mountain, and then you've got this little hill over here on the right. What these, for the most part, are down here would probably be contracts based off negotiated cash. What you're going to have in the middle here are probably contracts based off of the CME index and or some sort of blend of, of cash cutout. And then this little hill up here on the right, those are probably be contracts that are based off cutout. And look at the disparity of the price that were paid for pigs based on the contracts in the library. Again, it doesn't mean that all of these contracts were delivered upon on Monday. It just means that if you take all of the contracts on Monday that exist, if they were delivered upon, this would be the price distribution. You know, so someone someone has a contract out there that would have paid 41 cents per hundred weight and someone 85. And that would have been just a snapshot for that one day on one day. If you look at just swine or pork market formula pigs, and we take that operation one, okay, and, and the the, uh, the pigs that were delivered against that contract on Monday, national plus 350 on Monday would have been 60 cents per hundred weight, okay? Just a, a little bit above average. And keep in mind that all of the contracts in here are base price, as you see here, base price distribution. So just a little bit above average, but keep in mind that 350 might be a premium on this specific contract, and that's why it's sitting up here possibly just north of, of most of the cash contracts. If you look at a three-year average, 
that national plus 350 again would be slightly above this grouping down here. But you can see that on a three year average, you still have these groupings of probably cash contracts, blend of cash and cutout and or CME index. And then up here, probably just cut out these contracts. So in general, what you're looking at with the con with this USJ20 contract library, it's mandatory reporting for each unique contract between packer and producer. It allows for transparency of contracts being delivered upon. And that's where it kind of stops. It does not report the volume of pigs being delivered on each contract. It doesn't give you the number of producers on each contract or which packers are using which contracts. So again, it's kind of theoretical in nature. It's, it's if these contracts were delivered upon, how many contracts equate to each price? However, where that stops, there is other, there are other reports that continue from where that stops. And those reports would be the 201 report and the 215 report, which are the USDA slaughtered swine reports. What you're looking at here is a 201 report. And what I'm going to show you is that, oops, sorry. What I'm going to show you is that the average net price of 67.19 on Monday's kill, Tuesday's report for swine report market formula pigs, and this is the biggest grouping of pigs, was 67.19. So that gives you the, the 201 gives you the average, the high, and the low, right? What it doesn't give you is any more specifics than that. And that's where the 215 report picks up. The 215 report gives you in $2 increments the price for every pig, every producer sold pig that was slaughtered on Monday. So if you look at that 6719, it's right there. And I blew this section up just to make it easier to read for you. But what it shows you is that, yes, the average was 6719. But for instance, 6,700 pigs, sorry, 6,700 pigs got paid between six and eight dollars less than that 6719. And 13,205 pigs got paid between six and eight dollars more than that 6719. So if you take all of those, all of this information, download it historically, and then build a tool, you can start querying how your pigs were paid, and this is net price, this is the base price, how your pigs were paid relative to your peers. And if you look at the last day, okay, so this beyond 126, you're going to have that national plus 350 contract paying at $60 per hundredweight. That's about $7 less than you saw as the average for all swine or pork market formula pigs. And you can see here the amount of pigs on the, X, on the Y axis, you can see the amount of pigs that were killed within each $2 bucket. So 22,500 pigs that were swine or pork market formula pigs received about $66 per hundredweight. This contract, National Plus 350, at $60 per hundredweight. There you can see that 6,700 pigs. And then we can we can look at it historically. And what this shows you is the amount of days over the last three years that this contract, okay, the, the National Plus 350, would have been paid at each price point surrounding zero, which is average. So to be more specific, 137 times in the last three years, national plus 350 was paid $4 below the average price for all pigs. About 60 times over the last three years, this contract would have paid roughly $2, you know, zero between zero and $2 above the average price. So again, it gives you a lot more granularity on how your contract has actually performed relative to your peers over the course of the last one, three, five years. So to summarize the hog net price distribution, which is comes from the 215 report, it reports within $2 buckets the net price inclusive of discounts and or premiums of every producer sold hog process under mandatory report. 
So it allows a producer to compare their price receipts to peers on any given day. So in summary, uh, again, I know this, we went through this pretty quickly and you can tell that we only scratched the surface, but hog supply agreements have become more and more diverse and critical to producer success. The USDA does not have the information, or I'm sorry, does have the information available to allow for transparency of contracts and the necessary information for all producers. Now, there's a few things that we don't have time to touch on today, and those would be, you know, that the cash contract analysis involves more than just price. You also should consider volatility of the contract, the basis risk involved with the contract, and whether they have the ability to hedge the contract with a high degree of confidence. Again, my 10 minutes are up. However, we do have a link here um, to a prior webinar we did at the uh, Iowa Pork Industry Center uh, via Iowa Pork at Iowa State. And that link is right there. You can certainly use that link to access that webinar on their website. It dives into a lot more detail of what we covered today. Hopefully there'll be some, some more information that comes out in the Q&A. Um, but again, I'd like to thank Iowa Pork for having me. Thank you for your time today. And if you ever have any questions relative to any of this information, feel free to give us a, a call or, or shoot us an email at uh, CIH. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for those really great presentations. I will ask our presenters now to all turn on their video as, as well as audio, um, and we'll begin our question and answer part of, the, of this session. Uh, so now from our viewers, uh, this is the time to, to ask your questions. Uh, please type them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll try to get through the, the questions you have. Um, but depending on how many, uh, we'll, we'll try to get through them uh, with the time that we have. So there, there is a question al already, and, and I'll uh, direct this at Bill. Um, so the question is, how does a producer that uses the lean index for, for a packer agreement use the cutout contract to now manage risk? Yeah, so... Um... First of all, thanks again, uh, and thanks for the other presenters. I mean, it was a, a, a lot of information there, and I know uh, hopefully everyone found it useful. Um, you know, so again, I, I think it's important to, to, to take a look at the structure of the industry. As I, as I pointed out, I mean, you know, half, you know, 40% of the pigs anymore are in, in the hands of, uh, you know, packer own themselves, and by definition, don't transact in a negotiated market. I mean, so they're already buying corn and meal and selling pork. Um, you know, that, that section of the industry, which is 40%, um, is already 100% cut out as opposed to some uh, compilation of both, which is what the CME index represents. And then within the CME index, by my math, it's somewhere between 40 and 50% of the CME index is comprised of, of, of pigs that are in some way, shape, or form priced off the cutout already. Uh, you know, the, the important thing I think for the industry is when you put those two things together, as I said earlier, 60% of the pigs that die in the country today are already using the pork cutout as the primary price discovery or value um, mechanism. Importantly, as, uh, as Tim pointed out, there are still pigs that, that are not using any, any cutout. Uh, and, and I think what, 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 what I think the industry has an opportunity, given that the CME has listed both contracts, is as someone who is strictly on the negotiated market right now can use a combination of the two contracts to actually eliminate the cutout's influence on their hedge. For example, let's just say the CME index is 50-50. Um, two CME indexes minus one cutout index basically at that point eliminates the cutout's influence uh, on that hedge and allows a, a producer that's only on the negotiated market, uh, it would allow him to more effectively manage the pigs that he's got. And so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, every producer is different. Um, 
There are some that are going to produce, uh, the, the, the livestock they produce is, is very close to what the CME index currently is, but there are others that are completely, and again, 60% are definitely not anything like the CME index. So again, the, the important thing I guess I would stress is, is that uh, there's now with both contracts, uh, there's the ability for the producer groups that are 100% already on the cutout, either because they're fully integrated uh, or because of the way their contracts are structured to use uh, the new contract as a hedging mechanism. And on the other extreme, uh, some combination of the two contracts allow a producer that's only on the negotiated market to strip out the cutouts influence and uh, you know, would allow that producer to you know, hedge his negotiated uh, Western Corn Belt or national risk. Thank you, Bill. We had a question come in and, and Pat had, had answered part of it, but there was a follow-up. So the question was, what are the max dollars that can be placed per month or, or per producer uh, for, for the, the LRP insurance? And, and the answer was 40,000 head or 60 days of marketing, whichever is lower. And so Pat, just to confirm that uh, it's a total of 40,000 head uh, per month can be protected via these insurance products, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it gets a little confusing. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to address that uh, live here. Uh, 40,000 head per policy. So you can only write 40,000 at a time. And uh, that number, uh, also cannot exceed now 60 days worth of marketing. And so um, the, the previous 60 days from the expiration day of the LRP product, you have to be able to demonstrate that you can deliver uh, that many pigs during that time frame. So 40,000 per policy uh, written and uh, not to exceed 60 days of, of, of marketing. And then there's also an umbrella of, of an annual requirement of no more than 150,000 per head per year or your total marketings for your entity. Thank you, Pat. So th there's another question. I, I think this could be answered by, by Tim or Bill and, and they may have uh, differing uh, answers kind of what, what based on what their presentation was. But the comment was, uh, there's a USDA weekly comprehensive pork cutout that includes the formula, the forward, contracts and export trades, which could be another form of price discovery. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the question may be, do we see um, some contracts in the contract library that maybe utilize that comprehensive? And then, you know, how, how much is that maybe correlated with that negotiated cutout that, that may be, is used for that index for, for the cutout contract? Tim, you want to take a shot? Yeah, I can take the first part of that. Sure. Um, well, first of all, that is a good observation. And the comprehensive cutout is a, a tool that could become part of the price discovery over the course of the next several years. But the problem with it, as far as how new it is, wouldn't allow for much of a history of it. Uh, it I believe it was April of 2019, uh, Bill Correct no, me if I'm wrong, but right around April of 2019 that the comprehensive cutout started, it does have a, a high correlation to the negotiated, but it certainly fluctuates. We've seen anywhere from about $5 under to $5 over. It does have a little bit of a lag to it because it does include some formula pricing that may have lag, as well as export pricing that might lag off of the negotiated. So I think in the future, we certainly could see the comprehensive cutout become a bigger part of price discovery. But I think at this point, it's, it's probably just too new to use. Uh, and I don't know if you would agree with that, Bill, but. Yeah, I, 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 I really can't add much to it. I, I wish, you know, if, if we just look at the, the sister industry, the beef industry, the, the beef industry's had a comprehensive beef cutout for, for a number of years. And, and uh, you know, as Tim points out, um, you know, it is generally speaking, uh, correlated with the negotiated market. There are periods of time, uh, and I'm talking about the beef now, that, that, that it, it can diverge. So undoubtedly, uh, the USDA, in my opinion, has moved in the right direction uh, by, you know, releasing a comprehensive uh, cutout that I think 
in the long run will take the place of the negotiated as as a you know a, a primary measure of ultimate value you know at the end of the day the industry is the industry value is 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 defined by how much pork we can sell at a given dollar amount frankly speaking everything else is is how you're going the pie is going to be cut up you know so the the industry in my opinion is best served seeking ways to 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 figure out how to expand the overall value of the pork that's sold out there and the negotiated cutout is is whether it be beef or pork is the best tool we have for understanding what that value is doing on a on a quasi real time basis. So undoubtedly, in the long run, it'll 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 play a bigger role. Unfortunately, given its limited history, it's 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 a work in progress. Thank you, guys. Those gr great insightful answers to that. Uh, we got a general question um, for for anyone, and, and I think all three of you would would be great to hear your perspective. But when you talk to pork producers, do you sense a willingness to change up their risk management strategy from what they have traditionally done? Um, and I think really what we've experienced here in the last 10 to 12 months, you know, maybe highlights uh, the, the need to, to reevaluate some of those strategies and, and the importance in, in doing that. I can go first there. I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, not surprisingly, I don't think that's uh, the guys and gals that are left in this industry. Uh, uh, that's one of the best things that they that they can do is adapt uh, to to uh, changes. And it doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, managing risk or uh, uh, managing production or or uh, uh, figuring out uh, the best way to to be as productive as they can. So uh, no question about it. Uh, um, this is uh, an interesting, exciting, volatile time and. Uh, you know, the tools that uh, we presented here today um, as a group, the tools that are in front of uh, pork producers today, uh, there's no doubt there's a willingness to adapt and figure out the right way to use these tools to, to uh, uh, provide uh, a level of uh, risk management that's frankly been essential uh, to, to pork producers' success uh, in recent history. Uh, uh, and, and so, uh, absolutely, uh, very willing to adapt to change and, and, uh, um, and a tremendous opportunity in front of us to, to figure it out and do it well. Um, I'll just- uh, 100% I, agree, yeah. I, I, I obviously agree with Pat and I, I think the, the experiences of certainly last year um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the unprecedented times and, and, the, and the volatility that the, that the conditions that existed last year uh, presented has, has I think, uh, you know, driven a renewed focus on the need for two things. I mean, number one, risk management, uh, but number two, understanding, you know, really what, what the contract you have is and how it relates to the risk management tool you're using. And, um, you know, last year, I think highlighted and, and certainly, you know, Tim's presentation uh, uh, illustrated that the CME index, you know, is one price, but there's a litany of pigs out there that are, are, are anything but the CME index in terms of the composition, in terms of the value that, that, that those producers get. And so I think more than anything, what the, the sense I get from the producer community is, is that, you know, understanding you know, what contract you have and how it correlates, and, you know, call it basis, call it whatever you'd like, uh, you know, how that, how, that, how that contract or that hedge is likely to perform. Uh, the final thing I'll, I'll add is, is that uh, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's important, uh, I'm just gonna say this again, that, that the industry seeks some sort of common measure of value. You know, when, if you have 100 different producers with 100 different measures of value, when those producers get together on issues of marketing, they all speak in different directions. And, and, and it, 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 it presents a problem in terms of, you know, when you do go to places like the USDA and lobby them for certain things, you know, the, the, if everyone's wanting something different, it's, it's going to be difficult to, to ever achieve some common goal. And, uh, you know, I, again, I, I, I think that, you know, seeking some, you know, just because you have a negotiated, just because a negotiated pork cutout is, quote, the benchmark, doesn't prevent people from negotiating their hogs in an open market. I mean, it's just, it's just the benchmark that they start the negotiation at is different. 
And uh, I, I just think that, uh, you know, the sense that I get from the industry is, is that uh, more and more a need for a common benchmark is, 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 is growing. Yeah. And I'll just add as a, you know, to finish it off the, the topic, uh, we are already seeing a, a, a big shift in what our clients are using and the, the, the positive uh, feedback and the positive momentum that is building from both the insurance products as well as the uh, cutout uh, contract at the CME. Um, we've seen a big ad adaptation from our clients already in their risk management programs and, uh, and positive results already, to be honest. So uh, certainly that's the case across the board. Thank you, gentlemen, for all your great presentations and great comments to the questions we have. We are converting. I'm sure he's telling Pat what a great job he did right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we lost your audio, Lee. Uh, we lost Lee's audio, so we'll go ahead and have David wrap us up for the day. Thank you. All right. Many thanks to our audience for the questions and to our panelists for the engaging discussion. And Lee, thanks to you as well for your expertise and for moderating the session. Uh, and from my perspective, if there's a take home message here, I think it's the fact that even though we're all looking at the same market, there are multiple ways and places to mitigate price risks. You all likely have varying degrees of, of risk tolerance. So I think there have been various opportunities spoken about here today for everyone to grab a hold of, depending on where you land on that risk tolerance spectrum. Um, you all took the first step, the first proactive step in, in listening to this session today. So I now challenge each of you to take that next step and dig deeper into your business to find your cost savings that can result in the increased profits for your business. Consider today's speakers as provoking you to dig deeper and don't hesitate to reach out to take that next step. And before we let you go for the day, we want to remind you about the final hours for the Iowa Pork Foundation Scholarship Auction, Dollars for Swine Scholars. It will close at 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, the auction funds scholarships to support future professionals in the pork industry. Last year, the auction funded 23 scholarships. Help us support our youth through scholarships by supporting the auction. There are many great items and opportunities for cash donations as well. And for more information, go to iowapork.org and look for the Dollars for Swine Scholars link. But one, two, or, or more, uh, buy one or two or more items, there's no limit. Your dollars will make a difference. Thank you for joining us today for the 49th Iowa Pork Congress. Please enjoy your day and hashtag put more pork on your fork. Thank you all. Thank you.